coming to uh, Dr. Jesse Weir's Wagner sing-along. That will be <laughs> this afternoon. And today all we're going to do is have a little exercise in celestial navigation. And I'm sure that uh, in the audience there are a few who have been trained in the Navy or Air Forces, private pilots and such, uh, ships and airplanes. And this is one of the great histories of human development is navigation. And one thing that is shared by almost all cultures is, of course, a view of the stars and astronomy and then navigation. And today I'm going to give you just a brief uh, overview of some of the techniques that were used. And then courtesy of the bridge, I have been lent the ship's sextant, which uh, will demonstrate you and show you at the end of my talk. And then maybe we will be able to find land again. But uh, today I am having my last talk. I've already talked to you about the voyage of Mag Magellan and Captain Cook and some other aspects of the seas we've been sailing in. But today this is a, a view of how Traditionally, people would be able to cross the great ocean. Now here's a, a Roman tile, one of the few images of the god of the sea uh, to be distinguished from uh, Poseidon or Neptune, but this was the entire ocean was called Oceanus, uh, and the god of the oceans with his wife Europa would make endless offspring, which we call waves, and you can see it pouring out of his beard that way. Uh, but ever since very ancient times and prehistoric times, people have been charting the skies and using it as a guide to go around. I believe even the Aborigines would use celestial navigation as they walked across the great uh, plains of Australia to find their way because otherwise in the ocean and, the, and on land there are very few markers that are as steady and reliable as the night sky. And so here I have a quote from Aristotle who was one of the first to delineate and describe in detail many of the f functions of the natural world. And here he wrote, by the sun, the moon, stars, and planets as they follow their ordained paths in the heavens according to the immutable laws of the universe, may you chart your course on the surface of the seven seas. Now back in those earlier times, the seven seas were actually mostly parts of the Mediterranean, the various seas that are, were local there. We now refer to the larger world ocean. And in the earliest Greek astronomy, the positions of the planets and the solar lunar cycles were delineated and especially uh, this gentleman here, Hipparchus, was the first to describe the heavens in a grid pattern that then was transferred onto Earth that comes down to us to this day is latitude and longitude. And Ptolemy famously used some of these measurements to estimate the circumference of the Earth. And in some ways, the Greeks were far more knowledgeable and advanced at an earlier age than was true later in the medieval period, where many of these things had to be rediscovered. Here is an example of the early cosmology. What comes down to is a Roman copy of an early Greek statue of Atlas holding up the heavens in their spherical presentation and with the signs of the zodiac inscribed, and this has been recently studied in detail and measured such that they could date the year of the stars at that point to 125 BC. Now this statue, or rather the copy of the original, is in the museum in uh, Naples, Italy. But for how many, many centuries mar uh, mar mariners would go out offshore and they would be faced with the eternal problem, how do we get there or how do we get back? Most early mariners certainly went, uh, as we would call, coastal sailing or pilotage. They would follow headlands. They would occasionally, on a clear weather, go further offshore. And here's a recreation of a Viking ship finding its way through the fog of off the coast of Norway or to the Faroe Islands. And you can imagine that if you're in a clear tropical areas where there's like the South Pacific, where there's often a good view of the sky, but in northern climes and stormy weather, the skies are not available. Therefore, that was when most mariners would never go out. For instance, in the Mediterranean, in Venice, Pisa, and the early Mediterranean uh, city-states trading on the Mediterranean, they would never go out in winter. And vessels would only leave in the spring, come back in the fall, and the winter was the time when the sea was closed, they call it because of the conditions and also the difficulty of 
being able to sight the stars. Now, the, the Vikings curiously had a number of techniques which have been uh, lost. And this one I show, which is called a, a sunstone, which is a kind of a quartz crystal that when it has a dot painted on it, it will then polarize the light coming out of the sky. And this was used when it was cloudy. And if you use the sunstone properly, you get a polarization of sun light will which will indicate the direction of the sun. So even out on a foggy, cloudy day in the North Sea or the North Atlantic, they would use this to be able to have a very rudimentary sighting of the sun on a cloudy day. And these were mined in Iceland, and a few remain have been found as objects in Viking tombs. But for most of the world, going out into the ocean was a great terror, of course, that was the great unknown wet desert with all kinds of creatures, and so many people would go out and not come back. It was the European Age of Discovery that first came down and annotated the Southern Cross. This is Amerigo Vespucci when he came down the coast of South America, uh, Brazil down to near the Rio Plata, he first sighted this great southern constellation. Now, those of you who went up last night to see it, I'm sorry it was, uh, it didn't uh, appear for us last night, though I thought I saw a southern cross in my ice in my drink later, but that was maybe just me. Now, this will be the significant constellation that rises over the southern hemisphere and has been traditionally a sighting star for a constellation for f finding due south. It was also at the time felt that this was the uh, message from God that uh, Christians were supposed to sail south for a while. And then, of course, the Chinese had their own annotation of the skies and uh, celestial navigation, as I s described the other day, to be able to cross their familiar oceans and perhaps farther. There were missions sent around the world to annotate the skies better and to particularly measure the Earth. I mentioned Captain Cook's uh, voyage. The first uh, voyage was to go measure a transit of Venus. Here was an earlier time when Jesuit uh, astronomers were sent to Thailand to assist in sightings at the time. And so the knowledge of astronomy has certainly been contributed by many different cultures at many different times. But as you know, we still have the same sky and we can still use many of the techniques that were used thousands of years ago. Now, of course, this is the way it looks. When you are out on a clear day, you will see, or evening, you will see stars rising in the east and setting in the west. If you are in the northern hemisphere, you have what's called the circumpolar star, the north star, Polaris, up in relatively true north, and all of the northern hemisphere stars tend to rotate around that. As you go down to the equator, you have this spread that comes up and down and you can barely see the North Star or any of the circumpolar stars of the Southern Hemisphere. If you're now where we are in the Southern Hemisphere, there you will see a completely different star array and some of those are going around in the sky over what is the uh, South Pole in the sky, though there is no Southern Pole Star. You have to look at other constellations. Now, you can look in the newspapers and get your usual view, the star charts, which will say, as of this week, this is what you'll see. And, of course, there's summer, spring, winter constellations, depending on the, uh, the view from our little planet out into the cosmos, which changes because of the axis of rotation of the Earth. So then you have predictable of course, moon rises, planets, and then things like meteor showers. And these have been annotated for forever and have been used by mariners to find their way. If you just happen to be out in the middle of the ocean all by yourself in your canoe, you can use some rudimentary techniques to find uh, your way. Here is a, in the northern hemisphere, you can take a sighting off of the Big Dipper, which will then point to north, this perpendicular technique, uh, just a stick with a weight on it, and if you hold it with the two pointing stars of the Big Dipper here, then this line will be relatively close to true north. You can also take bearings for north off of other uh, constellations, Cygnus, Pegasus, uh, Auriga, and again, here's the Big Dipper here, or some major, that points to or some Minor, the Little Bear, and that is Polaris right there. You can take a rudimentary stick like the last illustration and measure these distances, which are, D here is actually just a distance for uh, calculation of 
the distance between stars so that you can take out into the other constellations a measurement that then standardizes your estimation of where north is. Now these are trained in maritime academies for uh, what they call uh, survival navigation. For instance, if you're in a life raft, you're often given a rudimentary compass and a rudimentary sextant, and you should know at least this so that if you happen to be somewhere and you're trying to get a direction, then you can use these techniques. And this is the way that ancient mariners would travel. They would sight Polaris, the North Star. They would take a bearing of the altitude of the North Star to determine their latitude. So the lower in the hemis in the, on the night sky the North Star is, the further south they are. The higher it is, of course, then the further north you are. Then you will also see different stars that are at a zenith. And that was important because you could also tell your latitude by a certain star would be directly overhead. By the way, zenith is an Arabic word. A lot of the terms in astronomy came to us from the Arabic tradition. Here's another constellation which you see all the time, which is Orion and Orion's belt, which is the, the string of stars across the constellation. Here you have Sirius and the dog star, Taurus on the other side, Pleiades, which is a cloud of a cluster of stars. And this can be predictably rising in the east and setting in the west. It, the, the belt goes down almost due west every night. Now this is an equatorial constellation that as it, as it comes across the sky, you can see it from almost everywhere on Earth and then you can get your, your bearing. Now here it rises in the east and it kind of, because you, you, it'll suddenly appear over the horizon, you have to watch it right at the right time to get your bearing as it r rises in the evening. So here again you'll have a rudimentary pointing stick and you'll take your approximate latitude and subtract that from 90 degrees and then you will be able to determine a fairly close approximation of where east is. Now that's fairly simple so that uh, you, you have a general bearing. Of course, the, the major star that we watch every day is the sun to know east and west, and you can follow the rising and setting of the sun and get a relatively good bearing depending on your locality if you're used to where you are. Now, uh, you may be surprised if you live in the northern hemisphere, you're surprised to see the sun rising in the northeast. Now, we're used to seeing it in the, from the north, it rising in the southeast. So that's just the difference in where we are on the planet. Again, here we are, and we can see the southern cross, which will rise with uh, what these are called pointing stars that point to it. And th this is a rudimentary illustration of it. You can see it quite clearly on a clear night. And then when the cross stands, that is due south. This is a more detailed of it. You have the, the Southern Cross rising here. It is standing and then it will set. And so this means you can tell which way is south, but you have to be out there at the right time. It's very hard to tell if you happen to go out at, let's say, uh, 10 at night or 4 in the morning. It, it usually will be around midnight that it will stand up. The other major constellation people watch in the Southern Hemisphere are the Magellanic Clouds. These are large clusters of galaxies that are not far from the Southern Cross, but they again will rise and fall over the horizon so that you can make another rudimentary calculation from the Southern Cross up here and then a triangulate via the other stars, Canopus and Ashanar, to a point that is not an actual star, but they are that, by this illustration, will give you again a relative bearing of south. This gets kind of complicated though because if you measure wrong or your, your ship is moving too much, it's hard to do this uh, offhand and therefore this is again uh, survival navigation not typically used on a ship. Uh, you can also just use the uh, Magellanic clouds which are here and the other stars and as they will turn over the horizon again you can get a bearing of south. Now this was all mastered pr in prehistory by many peoples, but especially in the Indian Ocean and then most famously in Polynesia, the Polynesians would go out and often sail at night because they could get a clear star path, as they would call it, to where they were going. And here's some Santa Cruz Islanders back in the 1960s on one of their local catamarans. Now this kind of a rig was developed in the Indian Ocean and famously became the long distance Polynesian voyaging canoes. And they would take their journey out and of course they didn't have this thing of uh, light pollution. 
Uh, for instance, just on this ship, it's very hard to see the night sky with all of the lights on for security. Uh, but if you're really out there in a ve small vessel in the middle of the ocean, the, s the sky is so bright and things are very plain and clear to you on a clear night. The Polynesians would often uh, do uh, rigging sighting so that here you have another vessel with you keep the stars and a certain point you're rigging and if you head for that you will keep a bearing. Now you may be tossed around in the sea but you can always use that star as your steering star. Uh, that meant that the Polynesians would know their locality very well. They'd know their zenith star which would often be their island star they'd call it because it would rise right over their island. If they stayed there and they kept going east or west they would eventually find their island or somewhere else. They'd also use a technique called itak in Polynesian which is when they would leave an island and they would sight stars over the peaks of another island and thereby as you see this illustration they leave this home island and they take bearings off of the various stars as they go along until they finally reach their goal. Again this is something that you cannot do in the daytime that's why they would sail at night because they use these techniques to get across a very large sea. This is an illustration of one of the Polynesian navigators going to a neighboring island but by sighting this island and the uh, Southern Cross and the Mag Magellanic Cloud again they could take a fairly clear course across the ocean but just by that sighting. The Polynesians also used another uh, sighting device which was just a small cowrie shell that would be on a cord and then the length of the cord would be their estimation of an altitude of sighting a heavenly body for getting a latitude bearing. Now this is the most rudimentary sighting device uh, still used in, by some of the Polynesians. In the Arab Arabic tradition they'd use what's called a kamal or it means a guide and this would be a, a piece of wood that would have a string attached and you see it's actually held to the teeth so that the distance can be steadied and thereby again an altitude bearing being taken. The Vikings had similar techniques. Here's an old uh, sighting stone which would be carved with indications of certain latitudes at certain times of the year and primarily for the crossing of North Atlantic from Norway to Faroe Islands, Iceland and Greenland and back. We have a tradition of instrumentation that though comes from the Arabs. This is an astrolab from the 11th, uh, 11th century and this is a met metallic device with a uh, indicator ring that moves and with uh, they'd have a hanging uh, sighter off of this but then it would be used for making a sighting. This came to Europe and then developed into what we now have as our sextant. The Arabs took some of the early Greek writings and translated it. This is an 11th century document in from Baghdad which describes Aristotle's uh, writings and the Ptolemaic Greek techniques that were lost in Europe at the time. It was finally was translated from Arabic to Latin and got to uh, Italy in the 1400s and initiated the rediscovery of some of the Greek knowledge and that along with other new instrumentations led to the development that comes to us today. Here's a nocturnal which was used for sighting the pole star and adjusting it to their various signs of the zodiac and the constellations. At the time of uh, the medieval period and then the age of discovery and the beginning of the maritime explorations they had fairly simple sighting sticks. So here's, here's a cross staff it's called where it just has a gradated stick with a movable um, cross piece and then that would be set to the horizon and to the moon or sun and then a rude estimation of a altitude could be obtained. The problem with this and other later instruments is that uh, a navigator who had to do this every day would burn out their eyes. So typically navigators became blind in one eye and they, then they better retire otherwise they'll burn out their other eye with gazing directly at the sun. So here's a, another variation with a uh, not looking at the sun but with an eyepiece looking at a uh, transit board and then uh, a mirror here that would then ha allow an adjustment of the measurement sticks and get another angle. The great improvement came when Newton invented the double reflecting mirror for his optical studies and then uh, had these large land devices for sighting and getting a much more accurate sighting of heavenly bodies and then this became adapted into what's called the octet and now we have the sextet 
sextant, which is the sixth of an arc with the mirrors that will bring the sight into the instrument without burning your eyes so badly. And this led to the ongoing navigation around the world. Here is the Mariner's Mirror, which describes the techniques of using these instruments, cartography and other a aspects of uh, nautical science. It was published in 1588. This was taken from Dutch and earlier sources from Italy and is in this tradition that came from other cultures for so long. Here is the earliest of the style of a compass, though. I described that the Chinese compass was essential to the development of this capability in Europe. But the Vikings and earlier navigators had what's called a sun compass, which is simply a bucket of water with a floating piece of wood that can give you a, a little sundial effect so that that would be used to again, check latitude. And even though it's very rudimentary, it could be combined with, for instance, the indicator of the wind, and then they could get, catch the shadow of the rising sun and thereby get, a, a, again, a, a general direction, not very precise as a compass, but with good practice, it would be useful. The Chinese, though, of course, developed the magnetic compass, and I described this as uh, originally for astronomy, astrology, geomancy, or feng shui determination of roads and buildings on land, and then it was adapted as a maritime compass. And then when this finally came to Europe, it was adapted to the Mediterranean uh, winds. Uh, it uh, was actually King Alfred who, in England who then named it into the eight cardinal points which you see on the, the star here, and this became the compass rose. And now it's uh, delineated down to the 32 directions that can be called out as points traditionally. And now we have it down into 360 degrees and very fine calculation on a modern compass that are now, of course, not necessarily even magnetic. They can be uh, gyroscopic or other techniques. I showed this before. This is Magellan's own compass as illustrated in his log, and he has a wind indicator here that will then point down to where the winds are from. And uh, again, this is the, the this was not north, south, east, west. The, on this compass, they use the traditional Mediterranean names for the seasonal winds. This was Columbus's compass, perhaps, which is kept in the Canary Islands at a museum. And